In this short video entitled Pond in a Bucket, you will see how to demonstrate several key pond characteristics in a setting suitable to most classrooms. For this demonstration, we compared two treatments, each replicated and had one control. To get started, you will need the following materials. In addition to the buckets, which will serve as your pond, you will need several small plastic cups or beakers, baking soda, a sturdy ruler, a permanent marker, and a small amount of granular fertilizer. You will also need a balance with a tear function and a water quality kit for testing total alkalinity. To get started, first measure and mark the point which is 8 inches from the bottom of the bucket using the ruler and permanent marker. Once the bucket is marked, fill to the line using the water source of your choice. When filled to the line, pour the contents of the marked bucket into one of the empty buckets. By repeating these steps for each bucket, you will ensure that each pond has the same volume of water. Now it is time to measure the total alkalinity of our water source. We are using a Lamont water quality kit for this demonstration. Other kits are available and you should follow the instructions from your specific kit. We first need to collect a sample of our water source using the included sample bottle shown here. Once the sample has been collected, we need to select the appropriate syringe, which for this kit is labeled 0382. Refer to your kit's directions to ensure that you are using the correct equipment for accurate results. We then proceed to load the correct syringe with alkalinity titration reagent B. Care should be taken to remove any air bubbles from the syringe after filling by tapping them gently to the tip and pressing the plunger slightly to push them out. The syringe is filled to the zero mark as seen here. Now it is time to fill the test vial labeled 0608 to the 5 milliliter mark using sample water taken from our pond. Remember to read from the bottom of the meniscus. Next we add four drops of the indicator solution. Remember to refer to your kit's specific instructions to ensure accurate results. Once the indicator solution is added, the vial is capped and the solution is gently mixed. At this point, we have five milliliters of sample water from our pond and have added four drops of indicator solution. It is now time to begin the titration. Using the syringe we loaded to the zero mark with alkalinity titration reagent B, we add one drop and then gently swirl the solution. We repeat the procedure one drop at a time until the solution changes from blue to pink and record the level indicated on the titration syringe. You then add one additional drop of titration reagent to determine if the solution continues to change colors. If there is no additional change, the reading recorded prior to the addition of the drop is the total alkalinity of the sample. If there is a change following the addition of the drop, record a new reading from the syringe. Continue to alternate adding one drop and swirling the mixture and recording a value from the titration syringe until there is no additional change in color. For our water source, the total alkalinity was measured to be 14 parts per million. For our ponds to bloom appropriately, we need a total alkalinity of greater than 20 parts per million. In ponds, most of the total alkalinity is from carbonate or bicarbonate. Because of this, we can add baking soda, a source of bicarbonate, to increase the total alkalinity of our pond. Using our balance with a tear function, we measure out 1.25 grams of baking soda for each of our ponds. For this demonstration, the control pond is treated with bicarbonate. For each treatment pond, 1.25 grams of baking soda is added and stirred to help it dissolve. After one hour, 
the total alkalinity is measured again using the same procedure. For our demonstration, the treatment pond's total alkalinity has increased from 14 parts per million to an average of 86 parts per million. At this level, the total alkalinity is sufficient to allow our pond to bloom appropriately. 24 hours after measuring and increasing the total alkalinity of our ponds using baking soda as a bicarbonate source, it is time to fertilize. Once again, we will be using the balance with a tear function and a small vial or plastic cup to weigh out 2.25 grams of granular fertilizer for the first set of pond treatments. For the second set of pond treatments, we will follow the same procedure and weigh out 4.5 grams of granular fertilizer. We are nearly ready to transfer the measured amounts of granular fertilizer to their respective ponds. First, however, we will crush the fertilizer to aid its dissolution and reduce the algae bloom time in our ponds. Before adding fertilizer, label your ponds as Treatment 1, Treatment 2, and Control, based on how much fertilizer will be added to that particular pond. Remember, the control pond receives no fertilizer. It is now time to add our crushed fertilizer to the appropriate pond and stir. Each day after, the ponds should be stirred to further aid the dissolution of the added fertilizer. These photocomposites are of our two ponds treated with 2.25 grams of crushed fertilizer compared to our two ponds treated with 4.5 grams of fertilizer. Our control pond is the one in the middle. After 15 days, we combined our ponds of like treatments and test for several characteristics found in earthen ponds, including thermoclines, oxygen profiles, and sechi depth. We first wanted to take a closer look at the relationship between photosynthesis and dissolved oxygen in ponds. The algae bloom we see in our ponds is comprised of thousands of individual cells, one of which is represented here undergoing photosynthesis. The energy source for the photosynthesis reaction is the sun. When combined with carbon dioxide and water, the algae cell will produce oxygen and sugar. To demonstrate this in our pond, we use a battery-powered dissolved oxygen meter. You can also use your water quality test kit. Stratification across a thermocline occurs in earthen ponds where colder, denser water is on the bottom and warmer water is found closer to the surface. You may have noticed this while swimming. The phenomenon of stratification can be demonstrated in our pond in a bucket by following these steps. Place your pond in a bucket in a dark room overnight. This step removes the energy source for the photosynthesis reaction. Without the sun as an energy source for photosynthesis, the algae cell begins respiration. During respiration, the algae cells consume oxygen and produce carbon dioxide.
the respiration reaction is the reverse of the photosynthesis reaction. Now it is time to return our pond in a bucket to the sunlight. After a short period of time in the sunlight, the algae cells near the top of our pond in a bucket, representing the warmer water near the surface of an earthen pond, begin to photosynthesize. In this area, higher dissolved oxygen can be measured. If we lower the probe to the bottom of the bucket, representing the cooler, deeper pond water, lower dissolved oxygen levels are seen. Pay careful attention to the temperature readings in the lower right portion of the meter. The final pond characteristic we looked at was the sechi depth. This is important in determining if a pond needs to be fertilized. To do this, you will need a sechi disc, which you can make yourself, and a tape measure. By measuring how far down in the water column you can see a sechi disc, we can estimate the density of the algae population. This is important to make decisions about fertilization and the need for aeration. In our pond in a bucket, our sechi depth was measured to be around 8 inches. This table correlates the sechi depth reading with the bloom status, the need for fertilization, and the risk of a low oxygen event in our pond. For additional reading on this topic, these publications can be found through your county extension office or online at www.aces.edu publications.